Hi guys. Well, here. Dug our way into chapter two of Peruvian Plunge. I'm really going to make an effort to try to get each chapter all on one video so that didn't happen. I think I can get this all onto one if I dive right in. So in chapter two, you might have remembered we have arrived in Atalaya, Peru. And I'm getting ready to go meet up with a Stone Age Indian in the rainforest outside of uh, Atalaya. And so I'm appropriately enough going to title this chapter Back to the Stone Age. And obviously we're going to start out with a quote from about 1605 from Miguel Cervantes. <clears throat> said Don Quixote to his squire, Sancho Panza, as he pondered their uncertain future. We shall roam the mountains, the woods, the meadows, singing here, lamenting there, drinking the liquid crystal of the fountains, or the limpid streams of the rushing rivers. With a copious hand, the oaks will give us their sweetest fruit, the hard cork trees, their trunks as seats, the willows, their shade, the roses, their fragrance, the broad meadows, carpets of a thousand shades and colors, the clear, pure air, our breath, the moon and stars, our light, in spite of night's darkness, pleasure will give us our songs, joy, our weeping, Apollo, our verses, love, our conceits, and with these we shall make ourselves eternal. They withdrew and had a scant late supper, much against the will of Sancho Panza, to whom it seemed that the austerities of knight errantry were common in the forests and mountains, while abundance was displayed in castles and houses. But he considered that it could not always be day, and it could not always be night. So he spent that night sleeping while his master kept watch. <laughs> and that we are going to go from 1605 to Saturday, May 23rd, 2009, back to the Stone Age. <clears throat> My first Amazon Dawn, make sure that's right. My first Amazon Dawn roused me from my bed at 5 a.m. My intent had been to sneak out furtively to escape the over solicitous attention of Ernesto, but my hopes were dashed when the watchful cat like innkeeper pounced on me and lassoed me with invitations of hot coffee, eggs, and potatoes. Of course, this gave my friendly host an excuse to hold me prisoner in his kitchen for two hours while he prepared what should have been a 10-minute meal that I could have bought for 50 cents down the street. Ernesto took advantage of this opportunity to crank up his rapid-fire unintelligible monologue from the previous evening, the basic thesis of which was that I did not have the funds or the brains to accomplish my foolhardy quest. He kept insisting that the one-day boat ride from Atalaya to Manu would cost me $400, four times the total airfare from Cusco and 40 times the bus fare for the first half of the trip's total distance. Almost angrily, I told him I knew that was patently absurd because three people, including his own brother, had assured me that the boat trip would cost at most 40 to 50 bucks. Sure, that's true if you have eight or ten people in the boat with you, he explained with his usual hoots of laughter to punctuate his uh, hilarious wit. 
But if you're the only person in the boat, the price is still $400. He implored me once again to return to Cusco and take the damn 40 minute flight. I assured him I had no such intention. <clears throat> well, you say you want a great adventure? You'll get a great adventure, he hooted. He suggested once again that I shoot the moon and take a log raft if I was so hungry for a real Amazon adventure. When I told him that was a little too much of an adventure, even for my taste, he waved me off and let loose with yet another barrage of unintelligible Spanish, which translated loosely as, You whiny gringos are all the same. You say you come to the Amazon looking for adventure, and when you get 20 minutes into the forest, you're crying that you want to go back to the hotel. All I wanted was to get out of Ernesto's hotel and upriver to his kid brother's isolated jungle outpost on the banks of the exotic-sounding Rio Pini Pini and hang out with a Stone Age Indian for a few days. I shouldered my load of cannonballs and bid Ernesto farewell. I hadn't made it half a block into my six-block trudge before he was back at my side, prattling away madly as he grabbed squealing little village children, swinging them around his shoulder and over his head. Arriving at the almost empty dock, I confirmed that Ernesto's information was correct. Ever the optimist, I suggested to the boat captain that maybe seven or eight or even just three more gringo tourists would show up over the next three days to flesh out the $400 fare. This comment provoked exaggerated guffaws of laughter from all the folks sitting around the dock. Meanwhile, I said I needed a boat upriver into the jungle to Dante's isolated Kurtz-like jungle post. How much would he charge me for that trip? Quince soles. 15 soles, the equivalent of five dollars. Five bucks? This dude wanted a lousy five bucks to take me upriver, but 80 times that to take me downriver? How the hell did these guys figure out their pricing schemes? I gladly paid him the money, hefted my bag of cannonballs into the tipsy boat, and settled onto the hard wooden bench to enjoy my first river journey into the Peruvian heart of darkness. At the last second, the wise and old captain turned the job over to a 12-year-old Indian kid. He pushed us off from the bank with a long wooden pole, yanked the outboard engine to life, and pointed the bow resolutely upstream. We set off into the misty morning on our great jungle adventure. We had barely left the dock in Atalaya. I mean, we had been on the river for all of one minute and had barely gone two city blocks when up ahead approximately six more blocks perched atop a massive boulder protruding from the right bank was this ramshackle house that looked amazingly identical to Dante's isolated jungle outpost on the banks of the Rio Pini Pini. One minute later, when the kid pulled the boat onto a little beach beneath the house, I realized with sinking heart that this was my isolated jungle outpost, though the Rio Pini Pini was nowhere to be seen. Hell, I could swim back to Adelaia if I needed to stock up on more Oreos. <clears throat> Coming down the path to meet us was a freshly barbered, clean-cut guy about my age, dressed in gym shorts and a Briggs and Stratton t-shirt. No war paint, no tattoos, no bones through his nose, not even a lousy jaguar tooth necklace, just an unassuming guy who could have blended in with the background scenery in any modern American city. A lot better 
then yours truly could have. In fact, I introduced myself and offered him my hand. He shook it limply and introduced himself to me as Merino. In simple Spanish, much easier to understand than Ernesto's machine gun fire, Merino explained the layout of the place and showed me to my basic screened room in the back corner of the house. <clears throat> the tour continued perhaps 100 feet further up the hillside <clears throat> to the Spartan and primitive kitchen where a blackened kettle of water set heating over a smoky open fire. <clears throat> Beside the primitive hearth was a modern four-burner gas stove with two empty and useless canisters of propane, no doubt from the planet-eating Camasilla gas fields just north of Manu beside it. Marino communicated to me that he had been hoping I would bring some fresh propane with me. He was clearly unimpressed by my consolatory offering of rice and beans and potatoes. He had been hoping for some propane. God damn it! And the idiot gringo had, despite Dante's reminder, forgotten to bring any since he had no chainsaw either. The poor man would be forced to act like a damn Stone Age savage and go scour the wet forest for something vaguely resembling dry firewood. Our five-minute tour of the grounds over and done with, Marino indicated to me he was going up the hill to recover from his morning of hard labor and presumably to pout about the non-existent propane he had hoped for so desperately in his Stone Age savage heart. <clears throat> it was at this time about 8 a.m., I returned to the lower house and studied the amazing network of thin metal frame supports that somehow managed to attach the tri-level five-bedroom rambling guesthouse to the boulder it sat upon. Peeking around to make sure I was alone, I slipped out of my money belt and stuffed it into the toe of an old pair of muddy shit kickers. That job out of the way, I reclined in a hammock on the narrow porch that protruded out over the river to soak in the view and to reflect upon my unfolding Amazon adventure. Although Dante's isolated jungle lodge was not quite so remote as I would have preferred, I had to admit the views in all directions were indeed spectacular. Even though we were close enough to swim to Atalaya, the one curve of the river and the thick vegetation lying between me and town was enough to obliterate all traces of civilization. Unfortunately, the gentle murmur of the rapids below me and two distant waterfalls was not enough to drown out the honking horns of the various logging trucks, dump trucks, and chicken buses that plied the highway directly across the stream from my remote jungle bivouac. I mean, Ernesto had assured me in his gleeful pessimism that, I, that Atalaya would be lucky to see and therefore hear three vehicles per day. How bad could the noise be? That rhetorical question was answered about five minutes later when the angry, ugly scream of a fucking chainsaw ripped the heart and soul out of the lovely, misty morning. No! I almost screamed anything. Rain, mosquitoes, malaria, anything but a fucking chainsaw. Yes, the planet-eating devil called back to me from the logging operation approximately 200 feet from where I lay, relaxing in my hammock on my first morning in the Peruvian rainforest, well inside what my map clearly showed to be the nebulous cultural zone 
bringing the truer wilderness of Manu National Park, where only Stone Age Indians like Marino are permitted to tread. Minutes later, that sickening crack and reverberating crash of a murdered tree, a sound being repeated thousands upon thousands of time every day in rainforest around the globe, destroyed any vestige of hope I had of relaxing, a sense of utter hopeless, helpless desperation enveloped me as the saws begin their assault on the log now lying on the ground. Is there anywhere left on this planet outside of Antarctica to escape the sound of Gideon's trumpet? <clears throat> Bound and determined that I was not going to let my very first day in the Peruvian rainforest be destroyed by the sound of a planet-eating chainsaw, I extricated myself from my hammock and set off oh come on computer and set off to explore the further frontiers of Dante's 3,000 acre slice of paradise. I knew there was a second garden house somewhere further upstream and I set out to find it barefoot as usual. On my way out, I ran into Marino, who pointed excitedly to my bare feet, shaking his head no vociferously and repeating the chant, Serpientes! Serpientes! over and over again. I had been read the same riot act in Costa Rica just a few weeks earlier. It was one of the things, it was one thing to be accosted by the goddamn shoe police at some ritzy eco-lodge in Costa Rica, <clears throat> but I was in no mood to hear it from some Stone Age Indian who had probably never even heard of shoes until he was 40 years old. I asked him if he wore shoes in his village. He admitted he did not, but that was mainly because his village, his village had killed all the snakes years ago. Here, he assured me, serpientes were still plentiful, so of course he wore closed-toed boots. Didn't everybody? As politely as I could, I explained to Marino in my halting Spanish that I was not your average dumb gringo tourist and that I absolutely was not going to wear those fucking rubber boots, serpientes or no serpientes, period, case closed. I added to that harangue the fact that he did not need to feel obligated to take care of me. If he would just point out the trail to the other house, I would be on my barefoot way and he could go back to his hammock. He pointed vaguely uphill toward a steep muddy trail leading directly away from the river. <clears throat> Five minutes into the arduous climb, which appeared to be heading back to Cusco, I noticed that I had forgotten my drinking water and my mosquito repellent, backtracking down the muddy hillside in many ways worse than climbing up. I wasn't surprised to smack into the rubber-booted merino tracking me from a discreet distance, no doubt so he could carry my gringo carcass back to the lodge when I got bitten on the foot by a pit viper. He waited patiently for me to return and we fell in together on the hike, their barefooted intrepid gringo explorer leading the way, being followed by his rubber-booted Stone Age Indian guide. Along the way, Marino told me a little bit about his life. Marino, according to his account, was born on October 8, 1962, in the remote jungle village of Yami Bato, Peru, 
which was and still is about as far as you can get off the beaten track as anywhere on the planet. At that time, you know, in 1962, Yami Bato was in the virtually unexplored wilderness of a swath of rainforest that would later be set aside as the New Hampshire-sized Manu National Park. Marino was born into the Masha Gwenga tribe, one of several bands of natives who had, voluntary, who had voluntarily fled to the most remote part of the jungle some 100 years ago to escape the treacherous rubber barons whose enslavement and brutal treatment of Amazon Indians as a free labor force a process driven by American consumer demand for more tires was nothing short of a flat-out genocide every bit as horrific as the Holocaust of Nazi Germany. These scattered bands of escapees have returned to such a level of voluntary simplicity a level that American bliss ninnies with their simplify or die bumper stickers cannot even begin to grasp that today they are erroneously labeled uncontacted. Let's explode this trite Tarzan fantasy gringo myth right here and now, guys. There are no un contacted Stone Age tribes left on the face of this Google Earth dissected planet, period. End of story. I don't give a shit what Survival International or National Geographic or anyone else has to say about it. Those days are gone and buried with the dinosaur and the dodo bird. The closest you're going to get to an uncontacted tribe are folks like those in Yami Bato who choose to stay uncontacted and they have a line of armed cops guarding the river to make sure it stays that way. I hate to be the naysaying, myth-busting bearer of such bad news, but that's the long and short of it. And in the case of Marino's tribe, there are some 10,000 acculturated Mashi Gwengas living outside the protective reserve, chasing the almighty soul like all the rest of us schmucks. <clears throat> Stone Age natives like anyone else are a diverse group with divergent opinions just as there are a few tree-hugging, dirt-worshipping, ayahuasca-quaffing gringos, there are a few tree-hugging, dirt-worshipping, ayahuasca-quaffing Stone Age Indians left on this planet. There are fewer and fewer every year as the old ones die out, and any new ones coming into the fold should be thought of, thought of more as monks and nuns cloistered away in monasteries and convents than as representative of a majority viewpoint of opinion. I'll have a lot more to say about this in future chapters, no doubt. When I asked Marino how many people lived in his village, he considered the question like he'd never really thought about such a strange question before and answered, Bastante. Enough. <laughs> Enough, people. That enigmatic answer seemed to satisfy him, so it satisfied me as well. Families lived in se separate private houses but the whole village ate together in a large communal dining hall where they sat on the floor using leaves as plates and their fingers as silverware. Although Marino never learned to read or write, he said that there was now a school in his uncontacted village and had been for years and that all the kids coming up today are fluent 
in Spanish, though zero English is spoken there. Since I really didn't want to hear the answer, I didn't ask him about churches. I could never get a fix on what clothing, if any, his fellow villagers wear. However, since I cannot imagine a school full of naked little Stone Age children at their desks behind their books, I will assume it's mostly the same sad, ubiquitous, goodwill variety of gringo castoffs that clothe the bodies of uncontacted tribes all over the globe and have for years. Brandishing his machete, Marino recalled that the big cultural leap forward during his childhood was the introduction of machetes. He said that the men of his father's generation still used stone tools to hack through the jungle when he was a kid, but those days also were now ancient history. Although Marino was disappointed to report that Dante did not allow hunting on his private reserve, the clean-cut Indian assured me he could still knock a monkey out of a tree with a blowgun or take a taper out with a spear or bow and arrow with the best of them. I was encouraged to learn that no shotguns, chainsaws, or generators existed in his village yet, anyway. Marino, who is married and has two sons, told me his wife and kids had never laid eyes on a gringo. His wife will probably go to her grave never having seen a white face, though he predicts his sons will make the pilgrimage downriver sooner or later it was only eight years ago, he told me, in 2001, when he was 38 years old, that he took his own maiden four-day canoe voyage downriver and out of the forest for the first time in his life. He must have made friends fast on the outside because he described his first airplane ride to Lima, the cold air and fancy restaurants of Cusco and jaunts out of the country to Brazil and Bolivia. I was never able to confirm the details of these trips or where he got the money or the knowledge to take them. At present, Marino was planning to stick with his job at Dante's place until mid-July, then head back upstream to, to his village, though it was unclear what boat he was going to take, as I never saw his canoe. I asked him what he was planning to buy with the money from his job, and he told me clothes. I mentioned that if he had never left his village, then he wouldn't need clothes, and therefore wouldn't need to bust his ass working to buy them. He regarded me like I was totally clueless. Si, sí, pero necesito afuera. True, but I need clothes when I go outside the park. End of that circular argument. <clears throat> I'm not sure why, but for some reason, I was surprised to learn how free Marino was to travel back and forth between the Stone Age and the Space Age ostensibly to keep gringo diseases and assorted plastic baubles from polluting, if not decimating, the native population still clinging to their culture in Manu, the Peruvian government has made it Im impossible for tourists or missionaries or anthropologists or journalists to get upstream past a heavily guarded barrier on the Manu River. Apparently, however, curious natives are free to travel back and forth. It's not exactly like they can be held prisoner if they want to leave. It seems to me that this is an open invitation for folks like Marino to bring deadly diseases, not to mention the Eagles' greatest hits perhaps the deadliest disease of all, 
back with him when he returns from the other side. But hey, you can't sew up every loophole and security breach in a jungle the size of New Hampshire. Now can you? Marino seemed as surprised as I was that more of his Indian buddies did not did not join him on his forays to the white man's world, but he did not argue with me when I predicted that would rapidly begin to change as today's young, educated school children become tomorrow's curious young adults. The more I learned of Marino's peripatetic lifestyle, the more it dawned on me that he and I weren't all that different. Just as I have the freedom to roll up my mosquito net and bail back to Texas when I've eaten my last plate of rice and beans, Marino, too, is free to chunk those infernal rubber boots into the Mother of God River and paddle back to his village deep within the rainforest where no white person may follow well beyond the incessant clamor of chainsaws and honking horns. And that's more than I'm able to say about myself. We two middle-aged men were, for a few days, meeting at the crossroads between our two worlds there in Dante's little slice of paradise. As we continue to hike along the lushly vegetated ridgeline above the river, it occurred to me we were passing no really big trees. Don't get me wrong, the forest was lush and beautiful, but there were none of the truly mind-blowing emergent jungle giants towering above the 50-foot canopy we were walking below. Dante had admitted to me in Cusco that most of the big mahogany and cedar had been harvested from his property before he bought it, but there were no forest giants that I could make out anywhere except for the faintest enigmas of rotting old stumps. <clears throat> I asked Marino where all the big trees were, and he regarded me like the hopeless fool I was. Motoceros, chainsaws, he explained and shrugged. I asked him how long that forest had been wasted. He shrugged again. Veinte años? Twenty years? So that at least partly explained the logging operation that had routed me out of my hammock. These guys were already mowing down second growth forest in their never-ending quest for, for what? Not lumber, obviously. It would be at least a hundred years before this swath of ravaged rainforest would be able to produce commercial quantities of lumber. Firewood? Probably. Or, just as likely, to clear more land completely of every tree so some small-time squatter could plant a patch of yucca or bananas to feed the rapidly rising population of settlers, not to mention all those hungry Indian babies. It appeared to me that every woman, particularly every native woman, between the ages of 14 and 40 in southeast Peru, was terminately pregnant or nursing, or both. What still had me confused, and still has me confused, is exactly what level of protection is being afforded that protected stretch of rainforest by lumping it into the so-called Manu Cultural Reserve. Apparently, if the culture is based on logging, small-time land grabbing for farms, and breeding like termites, the Peruvian government is doing an excellent job of preserving that area's culture, though it's hard to figure out exactly what the animals and the forest itself are getting out of the politically correct but dubious distinction 
marked out on all the tourist maps in pretty shades of green. My guess is that it's the Peruvian government's sly way of deceiving tourists that the government is protecting a lot more land than it actually is protecting. This shady practice is rampant throughout Latin America. Of course, it has its roots in the U.S. Forest Service's own multi-use policy, i.e. logging, mineral exploration, ranching, hunting, etc. that is so conveniently hidden in all those huge areas of light green national forest covering so many maps in the U.S. So what right do I have to complain? As I was mulling over such mysteries, it began to rain just as the path veered sharply downhill. Marino, who had been plodding along politely behind me, sprinted ahead to the shelter of the garden house below. The steep trail bottomed out into a lovely lush grove of bamboo towering some 40 feet above me. Emerging from the bamboo, the trail entered the garden, which essentially amounted to a few derelict, sad-looking banana trees and pineapple plants, all of which had been ravaged by various animals, birds, and insects, leaving nothing, not so much as one lousy banana to snack on. The garden house was your basic thatched roof open air picnic shelter, perhaps 40 by 20 feet in area, supported by six upright logs the size of telephone poles. A rickety 12 foot ladder led up to the Spartan bareboard sleeping loft with no railing. That is where I found Goldilocks stretched out happily on a thin sleeping mat still wearing his rubber boots to protect himself from the dreaded loft vipers and hiding out from the rain. The thunderstorm lasted perhaps an hour. When the rain tapered off, I snuck away from the napping merino to go explore the rocky beach of the Rio Madre de Dios. I had been there perhaps 30 minutes marveling at the thousands of smooth bowling ball sized stones and trying to decipher the patchwork of strange animal tracks in the mud when my self-appointed guide and caretaker emerged from the bamboo to announce that it was time to head back to the ranch. I did not argue. Fortuitously, we arrived back home just as the lumberjacks across the river were winding up their day's assault on Manu National Park's cultural reserve. As peace settled over the valley in the gar gathering twilight, I prepared a spaghetti dinner over the fire while Marino recovered from his hard day in the hammock. We were enjoying our first dinner of vegetarian spaghetti washed down by my usual trusty piña coladas on the riverfront dining terrace when I learned that Stone Age Amazon Indians do not eat spicy foods. You would have thought I just handed Marino a plate of habanero peppers by his animated overreaction to the mildly spicy spaghetti sauce I had prepared. His rolling-eyed reaction of pure bliss to our dessert of double chocolate Oreos showed where his true taste lay. After dinner, I, retreated, I treated Marino to his first harmonica recital, which he at least pretended to appreciate. He was much more interested in my Sony Walkman and the Doors L.A. Woman CD than my own meager talents on the harmonica. So while my Stone Age friend lost himself in the earphones to Jim Morrison's frenetic ode 
to the topless bars, the cops and cars, motels, money, murder, and madness of the distant planet known as Los Angeles, California, I snuck off to my room to smoke a bowl. Thus fortified, I unrolled a sleeping pad and blanket on the open-air front porch to lay back and enjoy the river of stars pouring out of the blackness above the river of water. The Southern Cross twinkled brightly just beyond my right shoulder. Amazingly enough, not one mosquito, sandfly, or vampire bat molested me in my fresh air bed. I was drifting in and out of this quiet haze of tranquility when Marino appeared out of the darkness to return my Walkman and bid me buenas noches. Indeed it was buenas noches as I drifted off to sleep in my first real night under the stars in the Peruvian rainforest. Okay. What do you think? Little dog, you were not there. Anyway, we will be back. Chapter 3. Bye, guys.